picking it up in Genesis chapter 42. And although the text here doesn't specify, we've got Joseph about 40 years old. He's been in charge in Egypt for about 10 years at this point. Last week we saw Joseph elevated to ruler in Egypt when he interpreted Pharaoh's dream. And we found out we were told that he was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh. In the interpretation, he told Pharaoh that the reason God had given him two different dreams that were essentially one dream, meaning the same thing, was that this thing was to happen very quickly. And so my extrapolation from that is that the very next year began the cycle of what God had predicted through Pharaoh's dreams, that there were going to be seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine. And although chapter 42 doesn't tell us at the outset, we know that they're two years into the famine here. So I extrapolate from that that Joseph is about 40 years old at this point in time, and that's not overly important. The only interesting thing about it is we're going to find out a few chapters down that Jacob is 130 years old, and so that's how we were able to go back. We did a bit of a chronology on Genesis earlier and talked about the fact that Jacob was around 90 years old when Joseph was born. We typically don't think about that or don't realize it, but Jacob was rather old when he got married and started to have a family. <clears throat> But so, that's neither here nor there for picking it up in 42. At the end of 41, I guess we'll pick it up there, pick it up in verse, I think that says 56, but if I don't put my glasses on, I can't tell for sure. When the famine was spread over all the face of the earth, then Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians, and the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. The people of all the earth came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was severe in all the earth. So that's the background for chapter 42. I should point out that when we read that, the people of all the earth, famine severe in all the earth, is that that Hebrew word can be translated land, and obviously we would understand that people from the entire globe were not coming to Egypt for food. That was an impossibility in that day and age. But the known world to a writer or reader of Genesis, the area that they understood anywhere within Egypt's reach, you know, the, this was a very severe famine for whatever reason, whether it was a massive drought or what caused it. It was affecting not just Egypt, but the entire area. So it was very significant. Now Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt, and Jacob said to his sons, Why are you staring at one another? I wonder how he found out, but news travels fast even before modern communications, doesn't it? He said, Behold, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt, Go down there and buy some for us from that place that, so that we may live and not die. That's not a simple trip. You know, it's not like go to the grocery store and pick up a loaf of bread. When I lived over in Jerusalem, I took the opportunity to go down to Egypt for a study tour. <laughs> I don't know about the study part, but at least there was a tour involved. And we left... Jerusalem in the bus fairly early in the morning and we didn't get down to Cairo until evening. It is not a short trip and they didn't have an air-conditioned bus to take. So this was this was not a simple trip. This was not just get out, take a little walk, get some food and bring it back. So there would be have to be major preparation for this and there would have to be major reason for it. Cuz you're not taking a trip that's going to cover hundreds of miles in the day where you're doing it on foot or on donkey or camel or whatever you have, you're not making that trip unless you desperately need it. So that kind of emphasizes to us how significant this famine was for whatever reason. We know, you know Jacob had been very successful during his career, if we can use the term career. Jacob, we know, he, he had abundant herds. He had great wealth and yet somehow apparently what he had was no longer feeding him maybe as part of this famine there was some sort of plague that wiped out a great deal of livestock something happened they're desperate for food or maybe it's you know the verse does say now he saw that there was grain and maybe it was he still had the animals but he didn't want to constantly be slaughtering the, all his animals for food now if I'm Jacob and I have 11 sons. Jacob had 12. He just didn't know that Joseph was still alive and in Egypt. I will, I'm not sending 10 of them to go get the food. I, but maybe this is how severe it was that he wanted as much as 10 could bring back, as much as they could carry, pack animals, whatever. 
<clears throat> well, you know also, you know, he had a number of... Why has Joseph not sent word back? That's a more interesting question. Did anybody give that one any thought? <clears throat> Ed, was that clear in your throat because you gave it thought or you just needed to clear your throat? <laughs> Why does Joseph, for ten years, not contact his father when he easily could have done so? Joseph, for all intents and purposes was the monarch in Egypt. He was essentially a prime minister, a vizier, whatever term you want for him. He had all the authority of Pharaoh by Pharaoh's granting it to him. It wouldn't have been hard for him to send a party to his father to say, I'm alive and well and ruler in Egypt. Why does Joseph have, not do that, do you suppose? Wendy? I have a thought. A, my brothers hate me. B, my dad is so old, he's probably gone already. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think those are very valid. <laughs> his relationship with his brothers wasn't very good. Backing up to, <laughs> to your, put it mildly. Backing up to your ten brothers go down, it seems logical to me protection. Or did you already say that? Because yeah, I mean that that's one reason, but if if I were Jacob, I, it seems to me I would have sent a few of the sons and a lot of the servants. That's my thought. But that's not how it was done, and I think the reason for that is, be, well, I know the reason for that, is God was going to work things out and needed all ten brothers to go to find this out. Joseph doesn't know what if his brothers are still the same brothers who sold him into captivity. Obviously the same brothers, but have they changed? Has their person developed? Have, you know, have they understood what they did wrong? He doesn't know if his father's still alive or not. As we said, we're going to find out later in this. His father's 130. Now, granted, Abraham lived 175 and Isaac lived 180. So when Jacob stands before Pharaoh and Pharaoh asks his age, he says 130. And he says, I've lived few years compared to my father's. And it's true, he died much younger than they did, but he'd still lived to quite a great age. He may have wondered about his condition and ultimately... He would have really wondered about his brother Benjamin, but in his Egypt, full brother. They're not living that long. In Egypt, they're presumably not living that long, although we don't know that for sure. We don't have reliable records to figure out. But it does seem that Pharaoh is impressed with his age because the thing that's recorded in Scripture for us is Pharaoh says, Jacob, how old are you? Of course, that's, that's some chapters ahead. But yeah, Joseph had a lot of reasons to be concerned, to think that his father might not be alive, to wonder what happened to Benjamin. And so despite, despite Joseph's authority in Egypt, he may have had great concern of what had happened with his family back there. And either you know, no news is good news, he was afraid to find out, or he may have been afraid that something might happen if he did find out and reveal the truth. But the time will come. This setup, if you will, works perfectly. We're... Getting into the chapter here, for several chapters, for lack of a better term, Joseph is going to play mind games with his brothers. And he's doing that for a very specific reason. He wants to find out who his brothers are. And he wants to find out, how is his father? How is Benjamin? And he doesn't come out and ask those things. He's going to find out, but he's going to find out in a way where he can evaluate who his brothers are. Well, we'll we'll get into that because we're just about there. Pop on the glasses. It's just simpler. (laughs) There we go. Look how clear those words look now. I probably look real old on camera now. So verse 3, Then ten brothers of Joseph went down to buy grain from Egypt, but Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brothers, for he said, I am afraid that harm may befall him. Now Benjamin is a full-grown adult by now, but again, we continue to see Jacob's favoring of his favorite wife, Rachel, and by extension, her sons, who were Joseph and Benjamin. Joseph is gone, or so Jacob thinks. All he has left is Benjamin, and he continues to show this favoritism. And this must have been, you know, another, to his other ten sons. You ten go. Benjamin's staying because I'm afraid that harm will be falling. If something happens to you guys, oh well. (laughs) That's reading between the lines a little, but that's almost what you're getting in this. Jacob still hasn't completely learned the lesson despite what, his, what the favoritism that he showed had cost him. Now, granted, he didn't know what had happened to Joseph, so he didn't understand what it fav- the favoritism he showed had cost him. 
So verse 5, So the sons of Israel came to buy grain among those who were coming, for the famine was in the land of Canaan also. Now Joseph was the ruler over the land. He was the one who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. When Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he disguised himself to them and spoke to them harshly. And he said to them, Where have you come from? And they said, From the land of Canaan to buy food. But Joseph had recognized his brothers, although they did not recognize him. That's not surprising. Because you have ten men show up. So granted, 23 years have passed. As we said, Joseph was 17 when he was sold into slavery, and as I said, you extrapolate, he's about 40 now. You can change a lot between 17 and 40. I'm, I'm a pretty good example because I get a picture of me at 17. I get hair up here, not here. I look a little different. My wife will tell you she wouldn't recognize me from the pictures, so she wouldn't recognize me. It's not surprising, not to mention the fact Joseph is attired in Egyptian clothing. He's speaking the Egyptian language. We find out later on in the text there was an interpreter between them, so he wasn't speaking directly to his brothers. It might have shown if he was speaking in whatever language they were using at that point, the Hebrew dialect what, wouldn't have been the perfect equivalent of Hebrew, but whatever the language they, they used at the time would have maybe been a little bit of a giveaway, but not when he's speaking Egyptian. And they don't expect to see him. They had sold him into slavery, and they knew that, but after 23 years, I suspect they had kind of convinced themselves of the truth of the fact that he was dead. You know, what, what's the expression? There's nothing so believable as an oft-repeated lie. They would probably self-deluded into thinking, yeah, he probably really is dead and gone. They had said it so often and lived it out for their father for 23 years, and they believed it. Or the lowest of the low slave. Or the lowest of the low slave. Yeah, the last place they expect to see him is ruler of Egypt, even if he's, if he's still alive. <coughs> he sees the ten. Now, obviously, they would have changed greatly, too, in 23 years, but he knows where, they're com where they've come from. He asked them. He recognizes their language as a language he used to use on a regular basis, and even though the ten would have changed, you know, ten brothers, there, there, there'd be enough sticking out that you'd look and you'd figure out, okay, I know who these guys are. <laughs> and we're going to see later, obviously, he remembered quite well. And so they're he, pro They're probably calling each other by name, too. He would know the names. And that may be true. If he's listening to them, he's hearing them call the names. He's hearing Reuben and Simeon, Levi and Judah, whatever. I don't know how much of their conversation he was able to hear or how much personal conversation going, but maybe there were introductions all around or something. <clears throat> so he remembers, and this is where the games start, because he doesn't know what's going on, and in fact, Joseph would instantly have been suspicious, because ten showed up and Benjamin's not there. Jacob held Benjamin back for his safety. Joseph doesn't know that. What would Joseph be inclined to think? They got him too. Yeah, I don't know if you heard that. Ed said they got him too. Joseph would be inclined to think they may have done to Benjamin what they did to me. They got rid of one. Why wouldn't they get rid of another? It's quite logical to think that he approached it that way. So he recognized them. And then verse 9, Joseph remembered the dreams which he had about them. Remember the end of verse 6? Joseph's brothers came and bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. The dream comes true. It took 23 years, but the dream came true. So he remembered the dreams which he had about them and said to them, You are spies. You have come to look at the undefended parts of our land. Then they said to him, No, my lord, but your servants have come to buy food. We are all sons of one man. We are honest men. Your servants are not spies. Yet he said to them, No, but you have come to look at the undefended parts of our land. But they said, Your servants are twelve brothers in all, the son of one man in the land of Canaan. Behold, the youngest is with our father today, and one is no longer alive. Verse 13 was exactly what Joseph wanted to hear. The youngest one is back with our father. Jacob is alive. Benjamin is alive. Assuming they're telling the truth. But at this point, they wouldn't have had any reason not to tell the truth, because they don't know that's Joseph. If they had done something, what reason would they have for you know covering it up with this fella, whoever I mean, they he didn't was? Cover up the fact that <clears throat> jo Joseph was dead. Well, they didn't. They didn't cover. I mean, they didn't know. In yeah. fact, it's it's interesting when you read the <clears throat> trend when you read back in the language. <clears throat> a lot of times, you basically see one is not, one is gone. 
you know, which was true to them. Whether they believed he was alive or not, you know, he's no longer with us. We use, we use that expression, don't we? What usually we refer to if somebody, you might say, he's no longer with us. But I could say he's no longer with us if I work for a company and somebody laughed. He's no longer with us. You may interpret that the wrong way. You, you can present things in, in different ways. But I took that as one with our father and the other one is not with our father. Yeah, and that's definitely a way that you could look at that. One is with our father and one is not with our father. <clears throat> or just kind of one is not. Mm -hmm. Because that would have been one way of expressing the fact that somebody's passed on as, as I, I, like I said, I think they've really deluded themselves into believing the lie. You can't prove it. Got to read between the lines for that. But that kind of seems what it is. So they've established that. The youngest is with our father today, and one is no longer alive. And Joseph heard exactly what he wanted to hear. Jacob's alive, Benjamin's alive, and now he just wants the proof. Joseph said to them, It is as I said to you, you are spies. By this you will be tested. By the life of Pharaoh, you shall not go from this place until your youngest brother comes here. Send one of you that he may get your brother while you remain confined, that your words may be tested whether there is truth in you. But if not by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies. So he put them all together in prison for three days. So it's an interesting aspect to this test. Benjamin was fairly young when Joseph was sold into slavery. We can extrapolate back and see that he was probably about 10, which at this point in time then would put him at about 33. It might be pretty difficult to recognize even your own brother if you haven't seen him since he's 10 and he's 33. But Joseph was probably confident that he could from family resemblance, from the language, etc. But think about this. If they truly were spies and Joseph didn't know who they were but just thought they were spies, couldn't they get any old person to stand as a younger brother as long as you know somebody who is clearly younger than them and stand in? So Joseph is setting up a test that if they thought, thought it through, they would have said, well, we can pass this test easily. We don't need the real thing. But they don't. See, God is superintending the games that Joseph plays here in a really, he's really getting, neat way. He's getting a little reprise. <clears throat> prize well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Joseph's getting a little reprise. In fact, we're going to see a number of times with his brothers where he inserts a little dig here and there. He is, he is definitely getting it back. But above all, what he really wants is to establish who his brothers are. His brothers have told him that Benjamin is alive, and he has no reason to doubt that. Because they didn't have to say, you know, we're, we're sons, we're 12. He just could have said, we're 10, if Joseph and Benjamin were both gone. They wouldn't have expected that this was Joseph, wouldn't expect that this man would know anything about it. So there was no reason for them not to be honest. So he understood they were honest. But he wants to see for himself how they're treating Benjamin and what they're willing to do. It's going to become really interesting as we get down through it and as we see... Judah taking the reins of the household that Reuben should have had. We alluded to that a little bit before, and as we get through the next few chapters, we'll get to that point, <clears throat> but we're not there yet. So he put them all together in prison for three days, verse 17. I guess he wanted to make sure that they knew he was serious, and he probably enjoyed the idea of them being in prison for three days, considering that he had 13 years of being a slave, a prisoner, a variety of things. Ed, are you trying to get my attention? <coughs> I was wrong. <laughs> I wanted to uh, insert Jean? something that they also, uh, they're in prison for, for three days, but they're getting rest, they're getting food and shelter. Yeah, I, I don't know what the prison was like, but I imagine that it may have been the same one Joseph served his time in because we were told that was Pharaoh's prison, you know, for Pharaoh's prisoners. Joseph is the second in command under Pharaoh. It would seem likely that's what he would have used. It, as prisons go, it probably wasn't bad, but it was still prison. <laughs> is, is, the, is the most rundown mobile home better than the nicest prison? Well, these days, I don't know in this country, but that's a, that's a whole other issue. No, freedom is important. When he put them in prison for three days, they didn't know for sure what would happen. He could have put them in and left them there and thrown away the key. They didn't know. So I don't imagine that that was 
They, they, they may have gotten some rest and they might have gotten fed, but I don't think it was three luxurious days for them. <laughs> no, I'm not saying that they appreciated it that way, but it could have been the motive as well for, for Joseph. Yeah. Or he could have been wanting time yeah. to think. You know, Joseph I, doesn't... Yeah, he, he could have been thinking stuff. about it. He could have been offering them three days of rest, but he could have, given his position, he could have done that somewhere nicer than a prison, so... <laughs> No, it wasn't. I, I, uh, I, I don't think that he had because he was those motives spies. in place. He wasn't going to give them. Yeah, he wasn't. He wasn't going to fet them glory. So that's what three three days in prison. I think they had to wonder. This guy thinks we're spies. Are we going to get out of here, <laughs> or are we, you know, are we going to live when we get out of here? But we obviously don't know for sure. But then he calls in the next <laughs> verse and he establishes some truth. He says, and this is interesting. Now Joseph said to them on the third day. Do this and live, for I fear God. And you wonder what that meant to them. Did they understand that he was talking about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Because no matter what word he used here, and we can go to the Hebrew word here, but frankly it doesn't help us a lot because Joseph was speaking Egyptian and it was being translated. So what they would have heard, what would they have understood? Because the Egyptians believed in gods, plural. So did they understand a monotheistic, infinite, almighty God when he said that? No matter what word came to them, what would they have understood? But he says, do this and live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers be confined in your prison. But as for the rest of you, go carry grain for the famine of your households and bring your youngest brother to me so that your words, so your words may be verified and you will not die. And they did so. So he changed what he said originally. And this may apply to talk about those three days time to think because initially he said, I'm going to keep you all of you here except send one back to get your brother. Now he says, I'm going to keep one, send the rest of you. He may have thought about it and said, you know what, if I only send one back, he might get into some sort of trouble and we'll never get this resolved. <laughs> So if I send nine of you back and just keep one, <clears throat> that'll help the situation. Maybe. Or maybe he just had second thoughts about keeping nine of his brothers in prison when one would do for the purpose. So there's an interesting thing, though. He's going to keep one of the non-favored brothers and send the nine back for the favorite brother. He must have known that Jacob wasn't going to like this. Joseph knew, you can't tell he didn't know, he knew that he was improperly favored by his father. So not only is he testing his brothers, but he's testing his father. Is my father still going to be so overprotective? Is he going to say, no, I'm not sending Benjamin, I don't care what happens to, it's going to be Simeon at this point in time, and the text hasn't told us yet. So there's a test for the brothers and a test for the father, interestingly <laughs> enough. Now, when I say that there's that test, two very different things. Joseph, I believe, trusted his father, but he knew of his father's failing in the way he treated the sons. He didn't trust his brothers. <laughs> he had good reason not to trust his brothers. His last interaction with his brothers was then throwing him to a pit and then selling him into slavery. But there's two sides to this test for the brothers and for Jacob. We're going to see what's happened with Jacob's fatherly love for all his children, and we kind of already saw a bit of that touched on by the fact that he didn't send Benjamin in the first place. So here we go. And interestingly enough, verse 21, their consciences have been pricking at them for 23 years. Now, I guess that's not surprising. I haven't sold anybody into slavery in my lifetime. If I had, I imagine that would bother me for quite a while. Probably everybody in here. <laughs> so, verse 21, Then they said to one another, Truly we are guilty concerning our brother, because we saw the distress of his soul when he pleaded with us, yet we would not listen. Therefore this distress has come upon us. And that sure so, came out in the last three days. Yeah, it sure came out in the last three days. They remember and they draw a connection. Even though they don't know this is Joseph playing the games with them, they draw a connection. They believe that they are suffering for the sins they've committed. 
they're right. They don't know how right they are because they don't realize it's Joseph pulling the strings and playing these games with them, but they are absolutely right. Reuben answered them, saying, Did I not tell you do not sin against the boy, and you would not listen? Now comes the reckoning for his blood. As I said, I think they truly thought he was dead. Reuben, well, in fact, Reuben was the one they had tricked about that. If we remember the story, Reuben had planned to come back and rescue him, and by the time Reuben came back, they'd sold him into slavery. So maybe they never told Reuben the truth over those 23 years. I don't know. It's hard to imagine that by this time the ten brothers don't all know what happened. I think it's hard to imagine anyway that they didn't at some point say, you know, here, here's everything that happened, let's keep our story straight or whatever, but maybe not. Maybe, Sarah, you like keep our, keeping our story straight or was there something else? The idea that they did this all undercover and they want to keep their story straight so then they make sure they all know what exactly really happened before making up the lie struck me as humorous. I mean, that seems to be the way they do it in TV. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I, uh, I, 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 I don't have anybody who's sold into slavery to cover up. But, <laughs> but practically speaking, I think you would want to be on the same page. If you're going to stand by a story for 23 years, I think, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. Jean, did you want to well, insert I something? Say, I think the idea in the one verse where um, Joseph said... Uh, for I fear God might have started the, the heart strings pulling. Yeah, I mean, it, again, I it's mean, possible. He knew what God or anything, just the mention of God to a family that... That, that might have really pricked their conscience even if they didn't think that Joseph feared God the way they knew God. And I don't know that I'll say they feared God because certainly his brother's... Uh, a lot of the fruit in their lives was <laughs> not the kind of fruit that would make me say that they feared God. But we also don't know what happened over these last 23 years. And I don't know what the Egyptian <clears throat> word was for God, but the Hebrew word that's translated is Elohim. <clears throat> yeah, and like I said, that may be significant or that may not be significant because no matter what word had been used there, it would be Joseph speaking to a translator who then spoke to them. So they would hear the word from the translator, and even if they had heard a word from a translator that would point them toward the one almighty God, they wouldn't be sure that that's what Joseph had said. But there's the <coughs> word El, which would be God, but Elohim is the plural, the plural form, singular form of God. <coughs> so I think that's important there. Can, that, can I add that one, could more have been. one more thought to what Gene is saying? Fear God... What if the brothers are thinking, well, yeah, of course we're, we're God's chosen, you know, my, my father's got this blessing, so he must know about the Jewish blessing. But it doesn't mean they fear God, but they know that they have, have this blessing. Yeah, I mean, you can, you can know it and not accept it. Ed, getting back to your point, if we were really going to point them toward Joseph fearing the one true God, the term that would have been a better choice there, I think, would have been Yahweh. Because that would be the personal name of God that they would recognize. Yeah. On the other hand, we have to point again toward the fact that that goes through a translation. And in fact, Elohim being plural would have fit right in with the Egyptian pantheon because they were, they were um, polytheists. They believed in many gods. I don't know what the uh, uh, Hebrew means, but the word for fear is Yah Yahweh, W A W sorry, Y A W R A Y. So is that? No, it wouldn't be related because it wouldn't be the same triconsonantal root. Okay, Yah Yah uh, Ray. It's, yeah, let's see that. it's a fact that unbelievers can see things occurring and, and, and understand that, you know, and even say, well, I guess I got my comeuppance. I, I, you know, they, they feel guilt without knowing God. Uh, and oftentimes they recognize the way things occurred, that this has just occurred so that I could get um, the repercussions that I deserve in their guilt. They don't have to be believers. That's what I think. Yeah, I, it's, it's, it's hard to say that they're believers at this point, given what yeah. we know about them. And again, what happened in those 23 years outside of the story with right. Judah, we don't know. 
Well, they, they're but, obviously, as they their, talk their together, they obviously pricked. recognize that, you know, their guilt. Mm -hmm. And and they, they realized, you know, and they basically said it, hey, we're getting what we deserve. Yeah, and clearly. And they deserved even more. But you can move on there. Uh, so, Joseph is not in... Joseph probably sometimes is enjoying these games he's playing with his brothers, but not really. We see that picking up in 23. They did not know, however, that Joseph understood, for there was an interpreter between them. We referred to that before the passage tells us now. Kathy, you want to insert something? You skipped 22. Then. I skipped 22. Didn't I read that? Oh, okay. Reuben answered them, saying, Did I not tell you do not sin against the boy, and you would not listen? I thought we had talked about that, because Reuben planned to return and rescue them. Yeah, they, they didn't know. Joseph was speaking, and he was speaking the Egyptian language. There was an interpreter between, and that's why we said the word that was used for God, you know, wh whatever word the interpreter brought to them, if it was Elohim, him as is recorded in our scriptures, but the language they were speaking would have been kind of a proto-Hebrew compared to the <laughs> biblical Hebrew anyway, so we can't be sure of that. But whatever it was, they wouldn't have been exactly sure what term Joseph had used. So it wouldn't necessarily have pointed them toward the idea that Joseph believed in the one true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In fact, their first thought probably would have been that he had no idea who the one true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was. Because they would assume that he had been raised in the Egyptian religion, worshipping a variety of gods. The most famous one is the god Ray, the sun god. You've probably heard all that stuff, but we don't need to get into all that. Yeah, most people pronounce it Rob, and it's actually pronounced Ray is our best understanding, but we don't understand much about the ancient Egyptian language anyway. So that's neither here nor there. <clears throat> so he turns away, verse 24, and weeps. He's not enjoying this, I don't think. He's enjoying it at times, <laughs> their comeuppance, but really, you can see an interesting thing. Even though for the 10 years he's been in charge in Egypt, he has not reached out to his family he wants a reconciliation here. He wants to get past this. He's just not sure it's time to do so yet or not. He has to complete his tests. When he returned and spoke to them, he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. And I guess in case we're wondering how prison is going to be, it'd be one thing to be in prison and walking around if you're bound. It's probably not quite as nice. Now, whether he left Simeon in bonds the entire time, I don't know, but... You know, there's, there's, there's somewhat of a level of severity here. Then Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain and to restore every man's silver in his sack. And it probably says money in your translation, but the Hebrew word for money and silver is the same. And there wasn't any such thing as money at that point in time. So somebody's reading a word in rather anachronistically there. Restored every man's silver in his sack and to give them provisions for the journey. And thus it was done for them. And of course, they're going to find this out eventually. Verse 26, so they loaded their donkeys with their grain and departed from there. As one of them opened his sack to give his donkey fodder at the lodging place, he saw his money, and behold, it was in the mouth of his sack. Then he said to his brothers, my money has been returned. Behold, it is even in my sack. And their hearts sank, and they turned trembling to one another, saying, what is this that God has done to us? They weren't just looking at it as a bonus. Their consciences are already pricked enough about what's been going on. Now they've got all this food, and they got it for free, because they've got all their money back. And they're going, whoa, what just happened? He already thought we were spies. Now he's going to think we're thieves, <laughs> brazen thieves right under his nose, and Simeon's still down there? we got to go back? They didn't want to go back. Not yet. Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're, yeah we're, we're going to get there. Obviously, we're not going to get there tonight. But they didn't want to go back. How much further are we going to get tonight. Let's see. Now we, if I get moving, we'll wrap up the chapter here. So verse 29, when they came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan, they told him all that had happened, saying, the man, the Lord of the land, spoke harshly with us and took us for spies of the country. But we said to him, we are honest men, we are not spies. We are 12 brothers, sons of our fathers. One is no longer alive and the youngest is with our father today in the land of Canaan. The man, the Lord of the land, said to us, by this I will know that you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers with me and take grain for the famine of your households and go. 
But bring your youngest brother to me, that I may know that you are not spies, but honest men. I will give your brother to you, and you may trade in the land. This is, of course, a recap of things we've already heard. Now it came about as they were emptying their sacks, to behold, every man's bundle of money was in his sack. We already knew that. If they had only opened one sack on the way back, they hadn't found out yet. And when they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were dismayed. Their father Jacob said to them, You have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is no more, and Simeon is no more, and you would take Benjamin. All these things are against me. That's kind of interesting. You have bereaved me of my children. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. Did Jacob on some level suspect something about what had happened between the brothers and Joseph? I mean, do we know? that? Well, I mean, it's been a long time since they sold Joseph, do we know that at some point they hadn't come out and, and said that, you know, we sold him or that, you know, they had some part in that? And, I mean, that even if they hadn't said that, they still would have thought he would be dead. We don't know that at some point they hadn't come clean, but I would suggest that the text argues for the idea they hadn't. One, granted it's an argument from silence, but of all the things that would have been recorded, it seems to me that would have been recorded if they actually had. And two, we don't see, you know, Jacob's relationship to the brothers has not gotten worse. It was never great, but it's not gotten worse. He cares to some level. He's concerned for Simeon here. You know, if it had found out that it had done that, based on the way Jacob had looked at Joseph and the other brothers before, and even we see here, his reaction probably would have been, never to send Benjamin, no matter what would happen to Simeon. Now, he kind of felt like that at first anyway, but eventually he was convinced. And I'm not sure that he ever would have gone to that. So I think when we combine the argument of silence between Jacob's current relationship with the other ten sons, it's hard for me to believe he knows that, especially since, and this is jumping forward, but when they finally find out it's Joseph and they get back, they, they tell him Joseph's alive and he's in charge of all Egypt. He wouldn't have expected that, but if they had come clean with him, he would have at least known there's a good chance Joseph was alive. Although they would never have expected to find him in charge of the largest, most powerful nation probably, maybe second most, on the earth at that time. So, and, and, and jumping ahead and speaking from silence, he never would have <clears throat> let Benjamin go with them. Yeah, that, that's, that's another great point. If indeed they had come clean about what they did with Joseph, would he ever have let Benjamin go for any reason with them? Hard to believe. And again, we don't know how they had changed right. in these 23 years except for Judah. If they had come clean early in that time and really worked to restore their father's trust, maybe. We don't get that recorded. I'm inclined to think it didn't happen. Can I be 100% sure on that? No, I can't, but I feel like I can be 99.9% .9 solid on that, the idea that Jacob still doesn't know for sure what has happened. This may have been a refer may have been more of an indirect kind of fault blaming. Joseph was out there. You guys were out there. How were you not able to rescue him from this wild animal? What happened? Is it because of the relationship you had? Because yeah, one, one thing I'm pretty sure he knew was that Joseph and the tent didn't get along. I'm pretty sure he knew that. And so he may have indirectly blamed them for what happened to Joseph without knowing that they were fully to blame for what actually had happened to Joseph, which he didn't he know kind about. Of explains but it it's in hard the next to know. So I, I'm not sure he's referencing Joseph so much, but the next sentence says you um Joseph is no more and Simeon is Yeah, no Joseph more. is no more and Simeon is no more. That's interesting. He's writing off Simeon already. Joseph is no more and Simeon is no more. Well, we know Simeon's alive and well. well. I guess well is a definition since last they saw him. He was bound and taken away prison. But he, he's alive and somewhat healthy. He's the only country in the world that has food at the moment. And the only he's country in, in, in his known area that has food. That's true. It, I, I guess I might have to amend my previous statement. Maybe prison was better off if there was food as opposed to starving elsewhere. I, I guess I'd rather eat a full meal in prison than starve in freedom. I don't know. When, I, when I don't know. Ask the guys from 1776. They might disagree. Give me liberty or give me death. When you're having a pity party and woe is me, you don't have a good outlook on anything. And that's true, too. If you're having a woe is me pity party, you don't have a good look, outlook on anything. And that was his outlook. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. And you would take Benjamin. All these things are against me. And then Reuben says something that to our culture is going to be really bizarre. 
I'll tell you that right now, but you probably already know that because I'm sure everybody in here has read this chapter before. Then Reuben spoke to his father, saying, You may put my two sons to death if I do not bring him back to you. Put him in my care, and I will return him to you. Now, I really think this is Reuben trying to establish himself, reestablish himself as the head of the household, as Jacob's firstborn son, the leader of the family. But boy, he does it in a really strange way, doesn't he? Here, hold your grandson. I'll bring back your son to you, and if not, you can kill your grandsons. I don't know if the camera would pick up my dad right here. I've got two sons. I don't think dad would be too interested in that. <laughs> but it does what do you... show that he recognizes Jacob's distinct affection for Benjamin. It's equivalent to two grandchildren. I mean, that's pretty strong bond. Okay, I get, uh, that's an interesting way. I don't know if you could hear it on the camera. Kathy says is the his affection for Benjamin. It's the equivalent to two grandsons, a strong bond. That's true. But there are still a couple interesting things about this. And I know it's going to be jumping ahead, but I have to make the comparison. One, we have to understand that in the Middle East, they don't always value life, even family life, the same way we do. Sometimes we hear in our culture of these honor killings, right? Where a father kills his daughter. This is generally in the Muslim in communities because somehow she's brought dishonor to the family and we say what father could ever do that I have two sons I don't have a daughter so I can't quite compare but I know I could never do something like that and everybody in this room feels the same way I'm confident but this culture's a little different and we have to understand that we don't have to like or respect it but we do have to understand that the culture is different. But I don't think that Reuben really <clears throat> believed that Jacob believed would, do that. would do that. No. That I, would be like, you know, you, you saying that to me for your two kids. Well, I'm not, you know, no way am I yeah. believing, you, you know, or are you believing that I'm going no, to No, not, your two not kids for a minute. That. But here's what's significant about it. Do you remember in the book of Job, in fact, I'm going to flip to the book of Job so I get it right. Because Job lost everything, including ten children. And do you remember what Satan says to God? <clears throat> Let's see. That's not the verse I want. Where is the verse I want? Yeah, he's, he's hit Job with everything. Job's lost all his riches. He's lost his ten children. And I'm going to read starting in chapter 2. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord... And Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? I'll jump over part of that. Verse 3, the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, excuse me, fearing God and turning away from evil. And he still holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him to ruin him without cause. Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin, yes, all that a man has he will give for his life. Now, Satan is an astute observer of human nature and human behavior. And in a lot of cases, that's a truth. What Reuben didn't do here is he didn't put himself on the line. Again, knowing that Jacob wasn't going to follow through with this. But nevertheless, he didn't put himself on the line. We're going to jump ahead. kind of hate to jump ahead sometimes. <clears throat> but I have to jump ahead. <clears throat> to chapter 44 <clears throat> and Judah starting in verse 18 this is where Benjamin is on the line and he's skipping a couple ahead but you probably remember the game Joseph has essentially set Benjamin up to make Benjamin look like he's guilty of thievery kind of like what he just did with the brothers except he's not going to do a lot with that uh, I hate it's such a long chapter, and there's so much I want to read it, but in verse 18, well, let me, let me pick it up in verse 14. When Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house, he, he was still there, and they fell on the ground before him. And ba -ba -ba, verse 16, Judah said, What can we say to my Lord? What can we speak? How can we justify ourselves? God has found out the iniquity of your servants. Behold, we are my Lord's slaves, both we and the one in whose possession the cup has been found. But he said... 
Far be it for me to do this. The man in whose possession the cup has been found, he shall be my slave. But as for you, go up in peace to your father. Joseph just said to them, I'm going to keep Benjamin as my slave and you other ten can go back. This is the ultimate test to his brothers. We're kind of jumping forward and giving away the end. But this is the ultimate test. Are they actually going to allow what happened to me to happen to Benjamin to save their own skin? And Judah is the one who stands up. Judah, in verse 18, approached him and said, Oh, Lord, may your servant please speak a word in my Lord's ears. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, and we'll get to that you know, a few weeks down the road anyhow. But I'm going to jump to verse 32. For your servant, and this is still Judah speaking to Joseph, became surety for the lad to my father, saying, If I do not bring him back to you, then let me bear the blame before my father forever. He didn't pass it on to his sons. And now he says to Joseph, Now therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the lad, a slave to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brothers. For how shall I go up to my father if the lad is not with me, for fear that I see the evil that would overtake my father? Judah does not substitute his sons. Judah puts himself in position. And if you ever wondered how Judah the fourthborn ultimately becomes the head of the family, I believe this is where it happens. This is where Judah shows himself worthy in a manner that Reuben simply wasn't. Now, of course, we also saw another reason for Reuben in the sin that he committed with his father's concubine, and we covered that a number of weeks ago, and we don't need to get to that again. And we know what happened. But Reuben, or excuse me, Judah establishes himself for lack of a better way of looking at it, because all you know, God chooses the blessing, not necessarily based on worth of a person. God chose Abraham, God chose Isaac, God chose Jacob. They didn't earn it, they were chosen. And so the same thing is true of Judah, but yet Judah does show himself worthy in a way. God is sovereign, and within his sovereignty, man has all the free will he wants. I think that's I think it was Tony Evans or somebody. I might be ascribing that wrong. Somebody came up with about the best definition you can come up with to put sovereignty and free will. So when I say Judah earned the right as head of the household, understand that he couldn't truly earn it, but yet he shows himself worthy for the position. Because what Reuben said, while noble, A, was empty. He had to know Jacob wasn't going to act on that. And B... If he thought he was, he didn't truly put his own skin on the line. Satan said, skin for skin, all a man has, he'll give for his life. In a lot of cases, that's true, isn't it? It wasn't the case in Reuben, excuse me, with Judah. Judah was willing to put his own skin on the line. Reuben was not willing to do so. Reuben shows himself, I think, to be an unworthy leader of the family. Indeed, he will not be the leader of the family. But Reuben's offer also wasn't accepted by Jacob. The last verse of chapter 42, get back and finish 42 because we're well past time. But Jacob said, my son shall not go down with you for his brother is dead and he alone is left. There's another interesting thing. Jacob has 12 sons, but he's really only counting two of them, the two of his favorite wife. He still hasn't completely learned that lesson, has he? If harm should befall him on the journey you are taking, then you will bring my gray hair down to Sheol in sorrow. He was already 130 years old. I don't know what he was worried about living that much longer for. But <laughs> So that's where we leave off in that chapter. And, of course, we know ultimately what's going to happen. And we've jumped ahead a number of times because it's, it, it's hard to do this narrative without jumping ahead and looking at these. I guess we could have waited several weeks and then flashed back to them. That, that may be, be how a good movie or TV show would do. But this isn't a movie or TV show, although we are on the Internet now. How about that? Comments, questions, thoughts? Let's close. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time of study here. And Lord, it can be interesting and even kind of amusing to see what Joseph is doing with his brothers. But we realize it's much more serious, much more severe than that, as indeed they could be sure their sin would find them out. And for 23 years, perhaps they'd felt guilty, but also assumed they'd gotten away with it. Lord, we thank you that although we can be sure our sin will find us out, If we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we know that we will not suffer the ultimate consequences of those sins. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We thank you for that eternal life. We thank you for the study of your scripture, knowing that all of of it points toward Jesus Christ our Savior. In his name we pray. Amen.